Okay. Ready? Yeah. All right. My name is Josephine Villa Esencio. Maros Wajido Anena. My name is David Suwa. My name is Fazla Kareem. I was always called like a terrorist or something along those lines because of the repression I live and I could speak for a lot of South Asian people that like it was kind of the norm growing up. It was a joke, but I always dodge it off. I've heard a lot growing up that I act very white. Um, whatever that means. My teachers would constantly um, they kind of do small microaggressions towards me. It was just simply saying that I was like Latinx. So they just kind of like never helped me in my writing because they would just play it off and say like, you're Latinx or like you're, you're Latina. Um, like I understand that your writing is not the best and they wouldn't really actually help me and provide support. It's almost like they don't believe that I'm me just because I'm not the stereotype of what a black female is supposed to be or a black person in general. But as I got older and more matured, I understood that that is absolutely not okay to be claimed under that title. And I learned to like speak back and really deny that claim of being a terrorist or being anything along those lines. I still say it to this day. I said it to my girlfriend yesterday. Like, damn, like, why are people looking at me right now? Or like, why am I like, stepping into like this room and everyone shifts their heads and their eyes. I was more like I didn't think that I would be enough for things in the future. Like I felt like I would constantly have to prove myself. Seventh grade having to pick it, pick cotton and being the only black person in class and telling my teacher I didn't want to do it, but I was forced to do it. I grew up in Compton, New Hampshire, and my high school is predominantly white. The town is predominantly white, um, and I grew up with white friends, so I was kind of used to it. And I knew U and H was going to be predominantly white, even though they say they're diverse. So I already knew, and I kind of just took it with a grain of salt. It is what it is. Um, and the frustrating part is when your whole floor, no one looks like you. Your building, majority, no one looks like you. It does get to you, but at the same time, it's, it's like a lesson, but you also get used to it. With like my brother coming here, I feel like I had kind of like knowledge about the university, and I knew that like if I wanted to like find a group, I'd have to actively find it. And I think that's, I say this to a lot of people, like freshman year is like, you really are lost by like your first semester, second semester, like you're have, probably having an identity crisis or whatever. And if you don't find like a footing, it's very hard for you to like, I guess survive. So I definitely actively tried to do stuff like my freshman year. I did like Caribbean Cats, which is like this dancing org, and like we performed at I think like a motorcycle event or something like that. Um, but you like definitely have to find these spaces with people that you want to be around and stuff. You have to like attend these events um, because you get to know these people. You go to like Beauregard Center. Um, you do all that stuff to, like find your people, but it's also to like keep your like mental sanity, you know, because if you walk around too much, you're not going to find a lot of faces that look like you. So you have to actively go to those spaces in order to feel kind of accepted and, and kind of natural. First semester here at UNH, I was very enclosed and very much an introvert. I'd really just talk to my connect friends and just stay in my dorm. But eventually come second semester, I saw the opportunities available to me and understood the idea of risk taking. If my whole college time was like the connect program, then I think it'd be a lot better than when everyone else came back on campus. You know what I'm saying?
Currently, I'm a mentor for the Connect program, and what the Connect program is, is a transitional program for high school students going into college and making that transition the easiest way possible for them. Typically, the Connect program accepts students of color, people from diverse backgrounds, including first generation or low income. A lot of people of color, um, a lot of people from different backgrounds, from different states and stuff like that, um, different walks of life, different sorts of just life in general and experiences in general. So. It was a very inclusive and safe space, and it felt like a very natural space. And as I went, I think a week before school started, and I was kind of like, oh, let's show you around. This is what happens. It was very much just like getting accustomed to campus before everyone else comes. Yeah, if you can imagine, it's like you're going on vacation and going back to like your normal life. Like you go on to vacation to like get away from something or try to enjoy yourself in the way you want to. And that's basically like what Connect was. And then going back to like what UNH actually is, that's the culture shock, culture shifts, the energy shifts, the environment shifts. When I came to UNH, I thought it was a great place, um, especially when I did the Connect program. But once I was out of the Connect program, I was kind of faced with like another like side of the coin of UNH, which is that. <laughs> Oh, I feel so sad. Damn, I didn't realize you were just taking a toll on me. But, um... Shit. They do value diversity in the Barrett Arts Center. I see it, I'm a part of it, and I can tell that they value diversity. And like, but it's very rare in other places that they develop, like value diversity. If it's not like student involved, under like the DSC umbrella of other student organizations, I do see that they do value diversity. In a person in the school that's 90% white, having that space, it's just something that like you don't realize you need until you have it. It's an umbrella of what is it, six orgs, but of just various different identities of where people can go um, and just be themselves and be surrounded by the people that have the same and share the same identities as you, or different identities, which is even better. Um, but it's just the opportunity of like weekly meetings that you can attend and kind of just like be yourself and learn about more things about your identities that other people can bring and, and stuff like that. So it's kind of this, um, it's kind of just like this group where you can just chill around and, and learn so much more about like cultures and, and different life experiences and just like soaking it all in um, rather than kind of just feeling like you're enclosed in this white institution. Black Student Union, it's a space where I actually have people who look look like me around me. Um, all of my classes are predominantly white kids. I'm usually the only black student in my class, so uh, having that space every Wednesday, and including being a part of the exec board, just having upperclassmen like kind of help me guide me through the year is really helpful. And it's also nice having upperclassmen who are able to feed you, give you rides, and things like that. I had met DK during freshman orientation, and he somehow remembered me um, when at the poster fair in the Stratford room. So he was like, and I met Zakia through there as well, so they told me about BSU. But other than that, I wouldn't have been able to seek it out. Zakia is the co-chair and DK is the business manager. I was generally surprised that DK had remembered you know, it's freshman orientation, there's like 4,000 freshmen that probably go through. So I was just like really happy and I was like telling my sister about it. I was like, someone remembers me, <laughs> which is really like cool. And they're like, come to BSU, um, we meet on this day at this time. So I was like, finally something for me to get involved in because I had a really hard time like adjusting to campus. POC events are literally pictures all over UNH. Like there's a, um, one of them from Mosaico from the Latinx heritage that was literally freshman year and they're bombarding it all over the campus. They use POC 
as the picture of diversity. But yet that small amount looks huge if you're looking at it in an advertising perspective. Because it seems to be in all the pictures. But not only that, you start noticing they're used. My good pal Steven. Um, Asian man has... I've seen him on websites on UNH. I've seen him um, on literally walking out of my building. I saw him on a calendar. Um, I've seen him everywhere. But the same picture, the same picture of him smiling. <laughs> he is literally advertising the diversity at UNH that's non-existent. You always try, you're like coming in as like a, like a wide-eyed freshman and you're like, oh, as much like, um, kind of academic attention on you would be the best for your academic career, that type of stuff, that sort of mentality. And I see it all the time once, once I like kept on moving up in years, I'm like, oh wow, this person's being tokenized, this person's tokenized. But at that stage, you're feeling like you're doing as much for yourself as you can. But then later on, you're like, oh, you're benefiting you're getting no benefits at all and the university is getting all the benefits you know it, it doesn't feel good um you feel like you did something but in reality it's like complete opposite um yeah it's kind of like you're being it's not kind of like you are being used for your identities and stuff like that and from like the various interviews that i've had with like the university and and like kind of like features and like whatever they want to like use me for this is like the first time I'm being asked about like adversity on campus or or what are the issues on campus and actually being documented. And I'm second semester senior, all just for like the outfits, all just for this image and stuff like that. So and you see it all over our websites, all over like the handouts and stuff like that. And same goes for my brother who like went here um, right before I did. Same exact thing happened. Everyone's like, oh, I saw your brother's video during orientation. I'm like, yeah, no. Currently, I serve as a diversity, equity, and inclusion chair of the professional business fraternity. And my job this year was to really acknowledge and provide um, resources for the people in the fraternity. And what I've noticed and sometimes is they lack knowledge and like a lot of people, not just in the fraternity, but in Paul College and the university, they lack knowledge of like even traditional customs of let's say religious backgrounds or historically cultural backgrounds. And my goal is for really people to just learn it and not take it for granted. I believe the idea of white privilege and from my stance is having the advantage from what I experienced, academic advantage. Both of my parents never went to college, so I am a first generation student. And continuing through college, naturally I felt like I had to work twice as hard as the given white individual attending you know, who I sit next to in class. And although it's a weird thought to think of, I'm very fortunate enough to be a first generation student. It's really taught me like the lows and the highs of life. The simple things that you do on a daily, as in like walking in store or like go, or not daily, I'd say, I'd say like typical things. Like I know like college for white people is more accessible than for minorities. For me as like a Latina, I grew up basically everybody telling me that college was the way out for me. And I never like, I guess when you're younger, you kind of just never understand what the way out is until you grow up more. But I knew it kind of felt like once I did go to college, I've accomplished everything I needed to do in life. Like once with college, I can open doors. But why were they closed? <laughs> like, I feel like when you ask a lot of POC students like why they're here, it's either like, oh, I got a good athletic scholarship or I got a, a financial aid. For me, flat, flat out because of financial aid. 
if I could have gone to the school and I could have afforded it, I wouldn't be here. But because of my family income and financial aid, I had to come here. And a lot of students, I ask them, they'll come from New York or other parts of the U.S. and they say because of the athletic scholarship we got. Um, so I think that's just reflected that like a lot of students don't want to be here necessarily or they don't want to stay, but it's the only option. Um, and I feel like the retention rate for stu POC students would be much higher um, if they had pe more people to stay, more people that look like them. And I think it's, I think it's reflective in the staff that if they're not staying, that's just more discouraging for POC students. Like, if someone doesn't even want to work here, why should I pay the school and do all this work? And it's, it might not pay off. But it's mostly it's just like whenever something happens, my sort of first instinct now as like a senior or even as like an upperclassman in general was like, I'm just trying to survive and I know if I'm going to try to take action through administration, it's just going to make my life a lot harder. And I'm going to have to do a lot more meetings. I'm going to have to explain myself a lot more. I'm like, why do I, why do I have to put energy in to explain myself when these sort of things happen? You know, it's, it's more so, again, like fending and surviving. It's like, I'm trying to protect myself rather than try to solve this kind of problem. And I think that's like a very sad sort of occurrence that I think a lot of people go through is because we're only here for four years and we're going to try to change an institution that is deliberately doing this to us from our perspectives what's the point of trying to do that and and when we do try to do things like when i was in orientation um we had we had someone drew up this plan that we all kind of liked about like diversity and then what we we're going to be showing and talking about with the orientees and that like completely got hijacked by higher administration um, they were just like, okay, we're going to be talking about diversity and inclusion, blah, blah, blah. And we're all just sitting there, like, arms crossed, like, what's going on here? Like, this is not what we're talking about. And then once we had a meeting with them, they're like, oh, we'll do this, this, and that. We'll do this, this, and that, bring in the diversity officer, whatever their title was, and everything will be fine and dandy. I'm like, obviously, they don't know how that goes. It's not going to be fine and dandy. It's just, just bureaucracy. It's just kind of like, um, kind of just like, dead promises, that type of thing, you know? So it's like all these emails that are written poorly, it's like, whatever, you read over it, you expect the same stuff, and you move on with your life, I guess, because nothing really ever happens that we actually want or, or something that's actually tangible that relates to our experiences here at UNH, so. I feel like they're tossing words in these emails about diversity as in a way to like have a checklist say like oh yeah and like i and it's you can also feel it like as a student i know that when i'm reading off the emails of like i feel like they're just checking off a list of, like okay we updated the students um but it doesn't feel like they updated it because they feel like they want to inform they just feel i feel like they're updating is like a receipt saying like you told us that we didn't update but here's like the receipts that we did send these emails but I feel like sometimes these emails are not even like clarification of anything. It just kind of says this is happening and da 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 da. But it never kind of feels, it feels performative. It just feels like, again, like a checklist of like, we are doing what we need to do. But I feel like they're not doing it out of their own, like, I guess, heart. I could agree with at least a majority of my friend group or POC is that a simple email about stuff going on in the news or stuff going on in the university isn't going to do justice. It's the physical activity that these administrations that were put in this position were accustomed to do and they need to fulfill that. Um, we Students can only do so much as to protest or send emails or become one, become one group and really drive what conflicts are going on within the university but at the same time we need that simple feedback because we're just as equal as any other student group or student population i feel like it's for sure i feel like um for their image like i've um one thing i, I it's just it just it makes no sense to me because i feel like they they say that they value diversity but yet they're not like helping these other student organizations and the Barrett Center when it comes to like resources or like they're constantly like, they, I, I feel that like reported, like um, 
for my friends that were going through microaggression. We never heard anything back from them. Um, so I just, it's just confusing because I feel like they're just saying all these words, but not actually like filling them up with actions. Like my freshman year, there was this girl that was like, oh, he's only like interested in like multi-ethnic girls. And I'm like, that's crazy that you just said that because that's absolutely like, whoa, you're not paying attention to like me, white person. It's like, oh, shut up. You know, it's like, I'm, I'm, it, it's so different because you like walk into a class and you have to worry about the people that are in it and not just the curriculum and stuff like that. Or you have to think about the topic and its relation to you and how it'll affect you. Are you gonna like go into this class and learn complete bullshit? And it's like, I hate this class because it's against like my views and stuff. Or like, are these people, you know, the classes like, oh, are these people that are taking this class gonna benefit me or harm me in so many different ways? So yeah, definitely going to spaces like, oh, I'm afraid to go into this space because of certain people. Um, but yeah, that's that goes with anything. Even going to a restaurant, it's like, oh, you're that group. That I am intelligent. I am funny. I'm not mean all the time. I'm not stubborn and I'm not high maintenance. Like, I'm just a person. I'm Mary Rose and whatever I like, I like. And whoever I am, I am. And I don't, it's just the, the labels that people put on you. That's what they expect you to be. And it's really frustrating when you have to fight everything you're going through as well as labels and try to get out of that label as well of just not being a black female and just being a person who's able to do all these things as a black female. A message I would give to people holding high positions here at UNH, whether that be Jimmy Dean or even different faculty and staff within the different colleges here, is that just be aware that POC students and the minority of student bodies struggle day by day even throughout the academic calendar year so just be aware and just be open it only takes a second or a minute or two to ask a question or be there for them you are the support system and you are the backbone for the success of your students so just be there every day i guess as far as like poc students is try to figure out who you are what you want and where you want to be i would try to worry less about even i'm going to try to take my own advice even though i won't don't worry so much about your surroundings like for me i always am trying to tone myself down to appease other people don't do that um be who you want to be be who you are um make noise be loud and if they don't want to listen be louder doing your research online would be a good step because i feel like you start slowly realizing it and then going on social media there's a whole like there's multiple UNH pages on just simply like about women at UNH being black at UNH all these stuff and getting these perspectives and I'm pretty sure many other colleges have the same thing we're not really that different even if if we actually are like perceptually and it's it's like not that hard to to teach a child or or even teach a student or teach a peer that like humans deserve to be treated like humans and i think that's really what i'd want to say to someone is like if you're treating them as an identity then you strip this humanity away from them and if you look at your poc friend for a poc friend rather than a friend then you strip that sort of humanity from them so i think what i try to tell people is deconstruct this dehumanization within your speech, like all this rhetoric, within your actions, within like your mentality, um, is actively trying to do that rather than just try to implement things that you could show people.